Welcome to Book to Where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. I am super excited about this episode. So, um, uh, you know, we say this often enough. I don't know that nine years ago when we started this podcast, we really would have thought, you know, we'll have Christopher Moore on for an interview. But now it's happening, and I am ridiculously excited about it. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely one of those authors that all along, like he's he's a bucket list or like a whatever, like your author wish list, your top five or whatever. Mm-hmm. He was de- he would definitely be on that list. Um, so it's an exciting moment that we're finally having a conversation with him. For anybody who doesn't know who we're talking about, which is kind of insane. Here's a quick bio. Uh, Christopher Moore is the author of the novel Secondhand Souls, Sacre Bleu, A Dirty Job, and Lamb. He lives in San Francisco, California. So we've reviewed I don't know how many books, so we've talked about the books. Our last episode, if you haven't heard it, is all about Shakespeare for Squirrels, the book I think we'll be talking about tonight. And uh, I don't know. Do we need to do anything else? Do we just bring Chris on? There's been enough suspense. Let's just go for it. Chris, thanks for joining us uh, tonight on Booked. We've been big fans for years, and we're very excited to have you on to talk about some of your work. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, one of the things that we try to do uh, when we're interviewing an author that we've recently uh, talked about one of their books is to to give them the opportunity to talk about it in their own words, because we spent time kind of saying what our impressions were, but it's nice to hear the author, um, uh, their take on it. So do you have like a quick kind of summary of what Shakespeare for Squirrels is all about? Well, it's it's only quick if you know the... uh the plot of a midsummer night's dream because basically <laughs> i did i did an interview with someone who said could you give a quick synopsis of a midsummer night's dream and and then i did and it was it turned out not being that quick um because it's a very 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 intricate uh plot with a whole lot of characters but uh the 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 quick uh, elevator pitch i guess is it's a midsummer night's dream told from the point of view of a shipwrecked fool named pocket um, who has his uh, shipwrecked on the shores of Athens and stumbled into the fairy wood and all the goings on. And he also ends up uh, discovering a murder and having and being forced to solve it in order to save the life of his apprentice, Drool, the giant doofus who travels with him. So that's the that's the short bit of it. If you don't know the plot of A Midsummer Night's Dream, then it takes a really long time to tell you what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're both notorious for not reading the synopsis for books that we know we want to read. We, we have a, like a white right. list of authors we know we want to review. So I'm not familiar with a Midsummer Night's Dream and quite honestly had no inkling until um, the afterward that that's where it came from, which is a little embarrassing to say. Um, that being said, um, it came up in our review um, that I don't feel that you need to be familiar with the Midsummer Night's Dream or the previous two books that feature Pocket the Fool. Um, do you do that on purpose, I guess? So is your story written in a way to remove the barriers to entry for people who may not be familiar with the the characters or, in this case, the the story that it's based on? Yeah, I, I hope so. So, it, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that it worked for you guys in that way because – um, and, and the other thing is it's it's all discovery. I mean, rather than it going, oh, look at the clever trick that this guy did um, with Shakespeare, it's, oh, this is completely a, a discovery of a whole new story. And uh, and I do write it that way. I want it to be – I want someone to be able to, you know, see an interesting cover and a admittedly bizarre title and say, oh, I'm going to check that out and and hopefully go forward from there. I don't really have a sense of it as it pertains to the character of Pocket um, and and his apprentice Drool and their pet monkey Jeff um, because I'm, I've written – this is my third book with those characters. So I don't really know if that comes off as, I, okay, I met this guy on page one and I, and I kind of got a sense of him. Um, I hope it does. But uh, but as far as whether the story follows the play or not, I, I'm, I hope that people ask me all the time, do I need to read Midsummer Night's Dream? And I say, first, don't read it, rent a, p- a performance of it or, you know, stream a performance of it because it's <laughs> much more accessible that way. And uh, and second, no. And so if that worked for you guys, then yes. Um, and this is a retelling. And in, in fact, all three of my Shakespeare based books are retellings of King Lear. 
Merchant of Venice and, and Othello are sort of put together in uh, Serpent of Venice and then this uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and it and they all diverge so far from the original Shakespeare that it's only the the real Shakespeare aficionado that's going to say, oh, wow, that's this character. And I recognize this scene. Or, and I, I try to put the lines in that are sort of um, – Normal, normal cultural literacy from each of the plays. Like uh, this play is, uh, oh, what fools these mortals be! Everybody knows that line, but they don't know where it came from. Or, um, and uh, and it, it pertained a lot to uh, Merchant of Venice when I did that because there's there were tons of lines that came from Merchant of Venice that people didn't know came from Merchant of Venice. So, so you know this being the totally not short answer is I, I, yes, <laughs> I do try to make it so that you don't have to have uh, prerequisites to read the book. All right. So tangentially, I guess, to that question then is, do you find it easier slash more fun? I guess, how do you compare um, basing a story on, as you said, three different works of Shakespeare versus like your original series or the, or the standalone books is, is one easier than the other? Do you enjoy one more than the other? Um, there's a little bit more discipline involved in, in doing, uh, a, a story that's based on, an, on some source work, whether it's, you know, the gospels and in, in my book lamb, um, or whether it's Shakespeare in those three books or whether it's in history. Uh, my, I, my book Sacre Bleu is, uh, sort of the story of the rise of impressionism in France in, in the late 1800s. And so there was a lot of stuff that had to fit at a certain point in time because it happened at a certain point in time. And that is, you have to be more disciplined because you have to color within certain lines, but it also gives you a structure that you you have to adhere to so you're not just sort of waving in the wind going, well, now what's going to happen? You know you're going to have to be in a certain place at a certain time. So it's a little bit of both. What it, it also, what it does as far as a disadvantage is some of the flaws that that Shakespeare was allowed to do or some of the things that don't translate well from this stage to a novel um, become problems you have to solve. Um, a, a really immediate sort of very pragmatic thing is Shakespeare will have five or six characters that whose names start with the same letter. In uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, two of the main characters who are almost interchangeable in their personalities are Hermia and Helena. Um and uh, you would never do that in a novel. In the first day at, at famous novelist school, they teach you don't have characters whose names start mm -hmm. with the same letters. Because mm -hmm. when you're reading, you know, we only read about, we only actually physically read about 30% of what we're looking at. And our brain fills in the rest. So, and I'm sure you guys have seen those tests where... Um, they take a page of, of text and maybe two thirds of the letters are missing, but you can still read it because your brain will automatically fill it in. And I, I did a gig with somebody on NPR one time who was a text expert and I asked her about it. She said, oh yeah, 30 to 70% you're actually reading. And if it's not there, you won't notice it, but you'll also fill it in, which explains why it, a lot of authors, including myself, find it really hard to edit, copy edit their own stuff. Because you'll look at a page 70 times and your brain will correct the error all the time. You won't actually see that there's a misspelling or, or you know, transposed letters or something like that. So where the hell did I start with this, this answer? Uh, <laughs> So, oh, so, so basically, the the sometimes the translation of an of a work that it's based on, um, it it sort of gives you problems to solve that you wouldn't have to solve if you weren't basing it in Shakespeare or the Bible or some other uh, work, history, for instance. But uh, um, so it's a little bit of uh, the advantage of knowing where you're going in a way, having a path to go on, and the disadvantage of having to solve problems that someone else created um, in a story. So going off of the, like how you mentioned in, in, incorporating historical elements in your books, um, Livius, for example, my co-host, uh, <laughs> doesn't really read nonfiction too much. He, he famously on the, on the podcast will talk about how he gets all of his history from the books we read. Um, so reading a book that has like historical stuff in, incorporated into it, especially like Sacre Bleu, um, do you, do you have kind of a hope that for some people it'll educate them or encourage them to kind of go further with, with the topic 
because I feel like that might be a that's that's probably happening whether you meant to or not. Yeah, I th- I think my my approach to it because I'm writing humorous novels and I need to keep people's attention and I need to keep them interested. And um, so my approach to research in general, but specifically in history is not, you know, what happened on what date in history. That's a structure. That's not really uh, that important. It's what's cool. What's the cool thing? Sacre Bleu is is a good example because it's a book about the color blue. And so, you know, all through it, there's just these weird little factoids about the color blue that, you know, for instance, the Greeks didn't have a word for the color blue and they considered it a shade of black and and the, the, all these weird things having to do with that color through history. So, yeah, I hope that the reader is doing the same thing I did when I discovered it, which is, wow, that's cool or that's interesting or I didn't know that or, you know, I, I'm now sort of feel like, well, I'm going to smoke that on Jeopardy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose that there's a certain amount of informing, but for me, I feel like I'm sharing something that I learned and, and an enthusiasm and an excitement that I, I might've learned about a, a certain period or era that I'm writing about. Um, with the Shakespeare books, it's a little different because I've changed the time periods, either because it's completely irrelevant as a Midsummer Night's Dream. There is no historical Athens that's an analog to what's in the play. I mean, it, it literally has mythical creatures in it. It has, you know, not only the king and queen of the fairies, but the main, the duke and, and Hippolyta or the queen of the Amazons and a Greek hero, Perseus, you know, so, um, although in his dotage, evidently, uh, hmm. so, uh, you know, there's not, there's no historical discipline to it. And there was no mythological, even, uh, discipline to Shakespeare's writing of it. And King Lear, the historical analog for King Lear was the fourth century BC. So the grand Norman castles that we sort of envision when we see a uh, performance of King Lear, they didn't exist at that point. It would have been, a, you know, a wooden and mud fort at best. Um, so I said it, I think, in um, the end of the 12th century um, in Britain. And the same thing with uh, Merchant of Venice and Othello. Those plays are set roughly about the 16th century. And I set them um, at the end of the 13th century because it was more interesting to me. There was more, there was cooler stuff going on. The Crusades were going on and Venice was financing them and stuff. So, um, and and so I think relative to that, the reader will find things that are interesting. Serpent of Venice, actually, there was a big war going on between, and it was 70 years ongoing between Venice and Genoa, who are on either side of the boot of uh, of Italy. And what was a great gift to me is that that's the war in which Marco Polo was taken prisoner, and he gives the oral history of uh, of his life, you know, the adventures of Marco Polo, he dictates to a, a guy in prison um, while he's a prisoner of war f- f- with Genoa. And so it was easy enough for me to put Pocket's idiot assistant, who also happens to have perfect recall, <laughs> in the cell with Marco Polo. And it was, I needed to get a a dragon to Venice in the end of the 13th century. And guess who had been to China and wrote about these giant river serpents that he saw. (laughs) Now, of course he was writing about crocodiles, but that's not what they look like in his book, you know? So I thought, yeah, no problem. A man eating river dragon in, uh, in Venice in the 13th century. But I think the interesting thing that the reader comes away with is, oh, I don't think I was aware that Marco Polo was a prisoner of war. Um, so, yeah, there's some of it. And, and it, I think more that it sparks, I, I'm hoping it sparks people's interest rather than it informs them, you know, that it's not, I don't want to, I don't care about being <laughs> James, James Michener and, um, or, or that fellow that writes this, the giant books about cities, Sutherland, I think is his name. Um, I, I'm more concerned with the context of a story. And then if there's something that historically you walk away from going, oh, I never thought about the Eiffel Tower actually being under construction in your neighborhood, um, <laughs> which is what's happening in Sacre Lua. Um <laughs> So so that's basically it. It's just sort of trying to point out to people what's cool and that um, amid the adventures of the characters is hopefully going to keep them interested and entertained. There's going to be a couple of times throughout this conversation where I just I, I straight up compliment some shit that happens in your books. So apologies for the uh, 
overt flattery, but don't s- suck up, please. <laughs> since it <laughs> since it came up, um, I, I've uh, of all the books you, that you've that you've read, one of the ones that I'm most impressed with from a layout or a, like a typesetting perspective or whatever is Sakri Blue, because of the blue color of the ink that's in there and stuff like that. Um, and I just thought that was a really cool extra. Um, and I'm assuming maybe that's just the hardcover. I don't know if it's all of the versions or whatever, but like, um, having the blue in the, in the, in the lettering, Uh um, I thought was a cool, like additional touch. So was that you or was that like a marketing kind of thing or how did that evolve? Well, you know, it, it was a surprise. I'll, I'll give you a little inside publishing here and, and I don't know if this will interest anybody, but, um, when I proposed Sacre Bleu, I, I said, look, I want to have art in it. And I'd, you know, and because it's a book about color, I'd like to have color plates in it. You know, and I grew up with, I'm sure as you guys did with, you know, books you'd get at the library that had color plates in it. And, you know, maybe I'm quite a bit older than you and you don't remember color plates in a book, but there, you'd get like the <laughs> mysterious island and it would have, you know, it's like 600 page book and there'd be like five color plates in it. And I just remember reading to them with such relish. And since it was a book about color, I wanted color art. And my editor said, no, you know, you can't. We, we checked into it. You, it's too expensive. You can't have color art. And Steve Martin had put out a book. Steve Martin, the comedian, writer, <laughs> banjo player. And it was called, I think, An Object of Beauty. Um, and it had – and he is a famous uh, modern art collector. Um, I mean, it is – I think – a whole wing of the L.A. County Modern Art Museum is donated by by Steve Martin. Um, and and so he had these color art in it. So I bought a copy of that and sent it to my editor and my and her boss, my publisher. Um, and I I said, well, you know, I understand why you possibly couldn't afford to put color art in my book. But I sell a lot more books than Steve Martin. Um <laughs> So should I just be talking to his publisher? And uh, and they went, you know, as it turns out, we can do color art. Um, and, and and so that was that was sort of the the you know me being a dick. Um, but but also the the nice surprise that they came back with. I didn't ask for the for the ink to be blue, but once they were setting the pages, they were color printing the pages. It was nothing for them to do all the all the ink in blue. And and I will say that my editor and my my publisher, you know, for for all the you know, my first agent told me on my first day I talked to him, he said, remember, publishers are the enemy. Um, but they've done some really cool stuff with my books. One of them, uh, A Dirty Job, is about a guy who gets the job of being deaf and he collects soul objects, those those objects that are prized by a person or or with a person that take on their soul and they glow, but only he can see that they glow. Well, when they put out the paperback cover of a dirty job, they put the title in glow in the dark ink and they didn't tell me. And so like most people, I discovered it one night it was sitting on my nightstand and I went, Holy shit, it's glowing. So they (laughs) kind of do some, they do some cool stuff (laughs) like that. And, and the, the blue ink in, in uh, Sacre Bleu, I would love it to have been my idea, but it was basically, something that I enabled by being a, a kind of, you know, little baby throwing a tantrum, I guess would be a good <laughs> analogy. Uh, but it's, it's definitely the, the prettiest book that I've, they've ever put mm. together, you know? Um, and that was a, certainly a team effort from the, the cover art, which I had to fight for. And, um, cause it has a cartoon naked girl on it. Um, to the blue ink, to the color art that's in it. Uh, it was it was really it's a nice achievement of publishing. It's got antique maps of Paris mm-hmm. on the, on the uh, uh, what do you call the end papers? You know, so yeah, it's a nice. Thank you. It's a nice book. I will pass on your compliment to to my publisher who we <laughs> we fought tooth and nail to make a nice looking book. You can just be like, see, I told you. <laughs> well, that was kind of what it, that's kind of what it was with the cover. The cover was they kept bringing me these really stupid cover ideas, and and uh, and I, I oh gosh, I'll, sure I'll tell you this story. It was like the head of sales, I think, and we were all meeting. I had done a graphic novel that was god awful, and but we were I was appearing at Comic Con in San Diego, and we were at this restaurant across from Comic Con, and there was a bunch of monkey mucks from the publisher there. 
And they showed me, they said, this is going to be the cover. And it was not anything remotely what I wanted for the cover. And I had um, already, uh, I tried to get a Mulca painting who is famous for doing like the jobs rolling papers poster from that, that was sort of a Renaissance thing in the sixties, but he pretty girls is what he did. Um, and I had a, I actually commissioned a cover and they weren't going to put that on because, and, and I said to the guy, why would you not do that? You know, because the book is about this woman who sort of seduces all these artists and inspires them. And he said, well, I just don't think that readers want to walk around with a book with a picture of a pretty girl in the cover. And I said, really? I said, you know, <laughs> and he said, you know, because most of your readers are men. And I said, well, first, 70 percent of my readers are women. And second, I want you to walk across the street to that convention center and do a lab mm. and then come back and tell me that they're <laughs> that guys don't want to look at pictures of pretty girls on the cover of something. Just yeah. just take a lap. And I, and I basically had this poor guy backed up against a, a post. Um, <laughs> but it was it was very stressful. And I fought him tooth and nail and finally got the cover on it. And then they put this like sensor ban across the front of it. And the book sold better than anything that I had ever done. And people loved it. And there was all these great comments of it. And so when they did the paperback, I went, can we take off the sensor ban from the front of it? You know, it's not, there's nobody that's going to completely freak out about cartoon boobs, really. Um because it was, it was a very stylized, it wasn't a realistic drawing at all. It was very sort of looked like a Marvel character almost, except Art Nouveau mm -hmm. style. So anyway, this is way more inside baseball publishing stuff than you ever <laughs> wanted to know. It's just, right. it was the worst time. I, it, it so exhausted me that I, the next two books that came out, it was like, they were like, what do you want in the cover? Like, I don't care, whatever. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to fight. <laughs> you know? While we're on the subject of publishers, um, you tell us a little bit of a story in the afterword of Shakespeare for Squirrels. Um, and and I'll, I guess I'll kind of let you you tell it in your own words. But um, maybe maybe for all the kudos we, we gave the publisher, it's it's time to take some back. So I guess my question is, you, you were a little bit um, you got a little bit sidetracked by the publisher on what you wanted to do, um, not for Shakespeare for Squirrels, but for Noir, the, the previous book. Um, and I really, I guess, how does that affect you as an artist? Because I mean, for for people who don't write and don't have to deal with publishers other than you know um, getting you know soliciting art copies, like I would just assume when Christopher Moore says, "Hey, here's my next book," they go, "Okay, we'll run it through an editor and they send it back for some you know for a little bit of extra editing and then you're done." But that's apparently not always the case. Well, it it had been for 15 books. I had, you know, and I, I tell this story every night when I'm on book tour, you know, the now virtual book tour. Um, and that's that um, I had never had one of those meetings where you go, oh, I want to do a history of the Spartans in, in, you know, third century B.C. And they go, fine, can you set it in Santa Monica in the 1970s? Um, which you hear about screenwriters <laughs> having to do all the time. Um, and, and they do. I have friends who are screenwriters and they do have that kind of, you know, one of the first things they tell they told me when I was asking is you have to learn to not call people a fucking idiot when you're in a movie, a, a <laughs> film meeting, because you will want to. Um, but I had never experienced that in publishing. And basically it was it was a new um, contract. And my agent, uh, after we signed the contract, I think it was for four books, he called me, said, well, you know, they don't want the Shakespeare book next. And I had already done all this, uh, this research for basically in a Midsummer Night's Dream, once you get to the fairy wood, it can be anywhere. And I think it's one of the reasons it's the most produced play because, you know, regardless of budget, um, you can play with themes. I've, I've seen, uh, the fairy would be set in a, it was supposed to be a city dump and all the fairies are wearing bin bags as, as costumes or, you know, <laughs> I've seen two glam punk versions of it. Um, uh, Michael Hoffman's movie with Callista Flockhart and Kevin Klein is all done sort of in a, uh, 1890s sort of, uh, boater hat and bicycle croquet kind of, uh, setting. And I don't even know what that's called, but it's one of those country house kind of settings. And, um, and it, so I thought, well, I need to bring something different to it and maybe something that's a challenge, though, because I've tried to not write the same book, you know, every time, even though some of them end up in a series. And I thought, well, I'll take Pocket to um, 
to Athens, but when they go to the Fairy Wood, it'll be Golden Gate Park in 1947. And everybody's going to be talking like Edward G. Robinson and George Raff and Humphrey Bogart from a gangster movie from the 1940s. And, you know, the the dames are all going to be dames and the guys are all going to be guys. And it, it's, you know, he, and he's going to have to experience sort of the culture shock of not only are there fairies, but there's time travel and he doesn't know what an automobile is. And that was kind of going to be, and so I'd done quite a bit of research on uh, 1940s San Francisco. So then my my agent calls and he says, well, your your editor's going to call and congratulate you in a minute and you, they don't want to do the Shakespeare book next. And I was like, oh, okay. And she called and she said, congratulations, we're going to do and be doing four more books together. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand you don't want to do the Shakespeare book. And she said, no, not next, not right away. And I think I had just done a book before uh, – the Serpent of Innocent, then I'd done Secondhand Souls. And so anyway, it was it, it was only a couple of books since that. And and she says, what else do you have? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And uh, I, I thought I I did a book in uh, in 2000. I wrote it in 2000. I think it came out in 2002 called um, or 2003 called Fluke. And it was about marine mammal researchers and, and humpback whales and weird stuff happens to them. And I've always wanted to do another one because the research was a gas. It was fantastic. I got to hang out with scientists and get in the water with whales and it was very cool. So um, I wanted to do another one. I thought, well, I could do another whale book. And there's always like a big dead air thing on the phone with people from New York because they <laughs> really don't, they don't really trust anything that's outdoors. And if it is outdoors, it should fit in Central Park. And there's hardly any whales there at all so they're like hey, yeah what else do you got and i i kind of thought okay i'd done all this tough guy talk research for midsummer i said well i could do a maltese falcony kind of thing and uh my editor goes yeah go with that and i said go with what she goes yeah go with the maltese falcony kind of thing and i said you want me to write a book based on a maltese falcony kind of thing as opposed to the 10 page proposal that I sent to you. And she says, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Now, so it, at one level, that's a great amount of confidence. It's like, you know, a multi falcony kind of thing. You've got this, go. Um, you know, they, she, she didn't ask any questions like, how are you going to make it work? Or what's it going to involve? Or what's the plot? Or anything like that. And I stayed um, on total radio silence for like a year or two. I was like, how's the book going? Great. You know, I wouldn't say shit about it. You know? <laughs> So it was like, so they were in New York, they were going, you know, because I know that they're having meetings all the time going, well, in the uh, spring of 2020, we're going to release this. And they're talking about it a year ahead about what's that about, Jennifer? And she'd go, no fucking idea. It's a Maltese Falcony kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, um, but I had already used up all my noir stuff in noir and I and and to her credit I was I'm really happy with how noir came out um I I don't know how I can tell you that this thing that ended up Shakespeare for squirrels which was not always the title um was uh would have been a much different book than it than it ended up and so when I sat down to write this one I was like well I don't have that cool conceit of of time travel to put in it and I I feel my mind had told me well you've already done that um, and, and so I just sort of went straight at a Midsummer Night's Dream, which, which I think consequently just made this book short and it made it a little bit easier to read, easier to write because I wasn't trying to deal with these two very distinct dialects, which one being fake 1940s gangster and fake American, um, coherent Shakespearean English, <laughs> you know, cause my stuff is not hard to read. <laughs> it just sounds Shakespeare. There's the, there's the odd the and thou put in there just to go, Oh yeah, that sounds completely Shakespeare. But if you actually look at a page of Shakespeare next to it, it's like, this is nothing like that, mm -hmm. which I think is a relief to people who, who have a little bit of a phobia about Shakespeare. So I, what the hell was the question? Um, Oh, the tell, tell you the story. around. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, and and you know, don't get me wrong. This is, I mean, my editors over the years, and and I've been with uh, Jennifer Brell since two thousand, since right after Lamb. So I've done ten books with her. Um, I mean, she's very light-handed with my stuff. I, very, um, almost nothing gets changed from the time I turn it in. My first drafts, 
minus a, quite a few grammatical and spelling errors. But other than that, she's very light handed. And, and I've been fortunate in that way with all my editors, um, which I think was kind of why this was a bit of a shock. But it was more something that was done. Uh, you could you can always tell when it comes down to this was something that somebody said in a meeting and it was completely based on a business model and had nothing to do with anything creative. And that happens less, I think, in publishing than it happens in um, in film and you know, for screenwriters. You know, um, you don't end up doing a lot of work because it was someone's turn to talk in a meeting and they didn't have anything to say. So they said something phenomenally stupid that's going to cost you <laughs> six months more work, um, which I, I've had happen. And I actually called somebody on the carpet in a, in a meeting in Hollywood one time when somebody said something and it was going to be like three more months work for me. And I go do you really mean that? Or was it just your turn to talk? And that's what you had to say. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> and, and they were sort of like, you know, cause the answer was, yes, it was just my turn to talk and I hadn't really thought it through, but no one's ever called me on it before. So I got fired from that job anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, that was the story. I, but my editor, she's been lovely over the last almost 20 years. I've been working with her. And that was one of the few times when, I got sort of sidetracked by something that that somebody, the powers that be somewhere decided I needed to do something differently. I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, because this is something that came up. And I think that because we've we've been doing this podcast for almost 10 years now and, and any book that you've come out with since we started the podcast has you know been reviewed by us. So we've had conversations about multiple books of yours on the on the podcast. Um, and I think we, we tend to come back to characters a lot when we're talking about your books because you write your characters very well and, and oh, thanks. <laughs> going deeper into that, the example I can think of is like you read through a book where, you know, um, the protagonist has a very specific style to them and then other mm -hmm. characters in the book are kind of just a little derivative of that or like influenced by the way that that character acts. So they all seem kind of the same. And that is absolutely not the case with your books. It feels like, at least to me, and I think Olivia's would agree, um, your characters are always very uniquely themselves. So um, what is what is your process like for fleshing out your characters, I guess? I, I had, I was, I had the benefit of a very, very good teacher, a guy named Shelley Lowenkoff that I didn't have in college. I went... Um, I took some extension courses at UCSB and I, I had to drive like three hours to get there or something like that um, from where I was living in Central California. But I had met him at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference and his deal uh, um, was start with character and for every single character you write, you have to know what they want and what they're willing to do to get it, even if they don't know it themselves. And that really helps you inform what you're going to have a character say in even the most minor situation. It gives a hidden agenda to everything that everybody says, and therefore it sort of gives a layer to it. And when you're writing comedy to have a layer to what people are saying, um, it, it fleshes it out. It gives you, you a, a, a sense of, of, there being more than, okay, it's her turn to talk or it's his turn to talk. And, and so I think that there's that. And I sort of use, I guess, a bit of the Stanislavski method that actors use, you know, of trying to, to empathize and using sense memory of saying, and I've been in these situations and I, for the longest time, I didn't, I wouldn't take pictures when I would uh, go to do research you know, I might jot down notes that sort of denote moments or or reactions to things. Um, but it was basically to build that character, to have someone say, uh, you know, to have someone feel a certain way at a certain time. But but I have to attribute a lot of that to having just having a great teacher who basically and I think he went on to evolve to change his priorities as a teacher later on, because I talked to him later on when I was actually teaching at the writer's conference. And, and he said, well, I'm on to narrative voice now. And I'm like, well, good. I got that. But, but, uh, um, so, so I happened to, I guess, excuse the word interface with a great teacher who had a great thing to teach at a time I needed to learn it. And that was how to, to put characters together with an agenda. Um, 
I also sort of do something I call Frankensteining characters, which is I will take aspects of different people I know or have met or have just perceived, you know, say I've watched and, 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 um, and make them all take those different aspects of those, those people and, and make them a character. And sometimes all you have is just one line that somebody said. And you go, okay, that's going to build a character. That was really operant when I was writing um, Lamb because I had to do these 13 apostles. And some of those guys don't even have a line in the Bible, <laughs> you know? Or they'll have one line and you have to build the entire character from one line or one scene that they're in. And, and you know, so consequently, you know, you have a lot of doofuses among the apostles because let's face it, a lot of the gospels is Jesus going, why are you not guys not getting this? Let me give you another parable. Um, but, but that's, that's, I think the answer to your question is to build each character with his own agenda. And I'm not so much one of these authors that writes a whole history of like, you know, what's Jeff's favorite ice cream or stuff like that. But that's not a bad way to go. It's just not what I do. What I'm more concerned with is what they want and what may have happened to them that influenced who they are. Um, like in, in noir, I have a guy named Milo who's um, a cab driver, but he hates driving because he was blown up in a tank in the <laughs> Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> and, and so, you know, he's a really good driver and he has a cab license and he has a cab, but he just he really would rather not drive if he doesn't have to. Um, so he may, basically makes his living standing outside of a diner, an all night diner, selling liquor to people out of this jacket pocket, um, which is based on a real guy. Um, and and the the idea of a cab driver who doesn't like to drive is based on a character uh, named Henry from Steinbeck's Cannery Row who is building a boat um, and is afraid of the ocean. And the other guys of Cannery Row go down every night and they start gluing barnacles on the side of his boat. And he's terrified that his boat is going to sea at night when he's not there. <laughs> and I thought, well, I need to bring that guy into the modern world. So, so, but, but, you know, Milo having been to, you know, the Battle of the Bulge and been blown up in the tank and all that stuff and, and, and now working as a cab driver, it informs everything about who he is. And, and he's not even a major character. Um, but, but, you know, he's going to emotionally, you're going to kind of emotionally know how he's going to react to things. And, and uh, mm -hmm. it's just work that needs to be done when you're, when you're writing a book, I think. Um, I, I give some credit to suspense writers and, and science fiction writers because a lot of them are under deadline and they're very plot oriented or, or world building mm -hmm. oriented. And yeah. they, and they're not spending as much time, not because they're lazy, but because they don't have it in in fleshing out characters um and for years that was a cliche about science fiction which i don't think um maintains anymore but it was you know it had they have really shallow characters and i don't find that to be the case at all anymore but you know if you look at heinlein his characters can be pretty one-dimensional um but he's doing some incredible uh plot work and some incredible story work and so forth um, and and it's, that may be if you guys are, are reading, you know, suspense authors and popular fiction authors, you may be finding, you know, that's the case, you know, and, and then I'm on the other side of characters that are more melodramatic, um, you know, like Stephanie Meyer's characters or Anne Rice's characters. That's an interesting point, because the thing that we we read a Dan Brown book way back in the day, and I don't I don't I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody, but I'll just say that the historical fiction parts are way better than characters and action, like characters and dialogue. So he's great at writing the history part. And I didn't care as much for like when the characters were involved. Well, you know, I, I've found one of the things I think, I think it's in uh, the author's note or something like that, the author's prayer or blessing, I guess, in the beginning of Lamb. And it says every book is perfect by or uh, attains perfection by what it is or by what it isn't. And so in, on the rare occasions when I teach a workshop and stuff, I tell people, you know, read everybody because they all have something to teach you. And, and the best example I have is Michael Crichton. His characters were god awful. With very few exceptions, very few exceptions, but there was no more readable author out there or 
you know, maybe John Grisham paced better, but but arguably. And uh, but man, if you wanted something explained to you, some complex concept that that really required some expertise or background, and you wanted it explained to you from the ground up in the context of the story, there was nobody better on the planet than Michael Crichton was. You know, um, that, and and you can take any of his books and and whatever he's writing about. By the end of it, you can kind of speak with a little bit of authority about you know whether it's airframes or or cloning or whatever. Um, but his characters were, with the exception of maybe Malcolm in the Jurassic Park books, they're pretty forgettable. Um, and uh, so, but what you learn from Michael Crichton is how do you explain stuff without making it tedious? Yep. And maybe that's kind of what you're saying with Dan Brown is like, wow, there's some cool historical stuff about this, you know, and, and the characters are sort of not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but that but he does that well. I mean, certainly, you know, you can't ignore somebody who was on the bestseller list for like five years. You know, it was a wildly annoying as an author to go, well, come on, dude, really <laughs> <laughs> make room. <laughs> All right. Now that we've covered um, characters, um, I would imagine, I guess I'm going to speak for myself here, but I, probably for a lot of your readers, that some characters really stand out. So off the top of my head, I, I said during this book that this might be Shakespeare for Squirrels might be the one that really endeared me to Pocket, although I enjoyed him in the other two. There was something maybe I'm at a different place in my life, but something mm -hmm. that this is the book that marked Pocket for me. I think of The Emperor. Um, mm. I think of Biff. So I imagine that for your readers, there's always one or two that are, they've become kind of iconic. Do you have a favorite character of your own? Oh, um, it's tough. And I mean, you named ones that, you know, right off the bat, I really like, um, and usually it's ones that have a really sort of strong voice and, and Biff and, and Pocket certainly do, you know, they're just, these very unlikely heroes, especially Pocket. You know, he's basically he's a he's physically tiny, you know, in the sense of a of a, a jockey um, being a small man. Um, and so when I created him in Fool, I wanted the least powerful uh, person in the entire court, but he can speak truth to power. And by the end of the book, he's running everything. He's manipulating everybody like they're puppets. But it's purely by the power of his wit and, and his being sort of a master's degree smart ass. Um, so he's, he's great fun to write. He takes a long time, a lot of times, but he was great fun to write. And Biff is the same way. Biff is sort of this rascal, um, you know, who always has sort of some period, uh, you know, it's like, well, that's, that's really great that you're the son of God. Is there a way I can get laid about, the, you know, because of that? And um, and so he was fun to write, and and um, uh, strangely enough, Abby Normal, who is a character, a goth girl in a couple of my vampire books, uh, "You Suck and Bite Me," she appears, and just the way she talks is so funny to me, because um, I modeled it on um, these b blogs. I, I wrote the first of those books, I think, around 2004, and and the internet basically the social media rage was MySpace and blogging was the thing that was happening. So there was all these goth blogs with all these really brilliant, funny kids writing this despair and these these really colorful metaphors, sort of rewriting Smith's lyrics and stuff like that. But they were hilarious. And I sort of picked up the idiom from and built this language that she uses, um, you know, about these the here's the dropped black bean burrito of my despair and that kind of <laughs> shit like that. And, uh, and she was so much fun because she could just take anything that would be very normal and make it dire and horrible um, in a very dramatic sort of wrist to forehead way. And so, you know, I, I'd say if I, if I had a, a favorite, it would be pocket. Um, but, but those three pocket and Biff and, and Abby normal, were probably the most fun to write because of them being so over the top and, and silly and either dramatic or comic, depending on which character it is. As, as you're, as you and Livius were talking about this, I'm, I'm kind of mentally going back through the books, like not all the books, but as the things that pop up in my mind and I'm thinking, wow, the character question that could be, that could be an hour 
discussion just on its own. But I'm going to completely derail that into something entirely different because this is the other overt flattery part of the uh, of the conversation. Okay. Um, the the stupidest angel um, is. Uh, I think that came out what early 2000s or whatever. So it's not it's not one of your more recent right. books. Right. Um, and I have to say, and I know this kind of spoils the book a little bit, but. Um, it completely disarmed me uh, because you get through, I'm imagining it's probably 80% of the book and all of a sudden there's fucking zombies and mm-hmm. I never saw it coming. And uh, I think I might've even like paused and called or talked to Livius to be like fucking zombies. Cause he'd already read it. So he knew it was coming and he didn't uh-huh. tell me. And I was just totally blown away that like they show up so late into the story and it was just completely you didn't like advertise it at all. It was just like all of the sudden. And I, and it, for me, it's like one of the most memorable moments of, of any of your books. Um, so there's not even a question there. I just wanted to talk about that part of that book. <laughs> so is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can't, I can't quite. No, it's out amazing. What... <laughs> it's what... <laughs> I was like, I can't believe this son of a bitch pulled off dropping zombies into this. And it was so great. It was a great moment in the book and, and it made me love the book so much more. So it was just such a like surprise. It just shocked me. It was great. Well, good. I'm glad it worked for you. It, it, um, <laughs> that, that's sort of a sampler of my work is it was because um, it has characters from three different books, mm-hmm. and four different books, I think. And um, they're all together on Christmas. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it, it was basically a book that was done by request. And people kept saying things like, we want more Roberto the Fruit Bat. Uh, there's a fruit bat in uh, Island of the Seek and Love Nun. And spoiler alert, he ends up talking about a third of the way into the book, but only when <laughs> no one else is looking. You know, so this, this <laughs> poor guy that started the book is like, wait a minute, did that fruit bat just say something to me? Um, and so I had to get a fruit bat to Central California for Christmas b- because people wanted more Roberto, and I didn't want to write another book set in Micronesia. So um, it, th- there's a lot of unlikely things going on in that book, but um, it's but it also had to be small so it would fit in that Christmas book format. So yeah. I have to say it's a tight book. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I mean, I'm, I'm, as, as having written 17 of these things, I think structurally. Stupidest Angel is one of the tightest things I've ever written. And just for like, well, that's a funny chapter that's only six pages long and it gets you to the next thing that you need to see. And it developed, I, I think it develops about seven characters and over the course of it. But um, um, yeah, the zombies were just a way to make it weird. You know? <laughs> sort of like, I need to make a, you know, I, I haven't seen that. And, it, it, and strangely enough, I think there's been like three or four Christmas zombie books since then. And of course, mm the walking dead and so forth. But, um, anyway, I'm glad it worked for you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, this next question is just a thinly, um, veiled way to find out if there's going to be any more Biff. Um, do you see futures for all of the, the kind of, we'll say series books that you've written? Are there ones that you know you're done with or, you know, is there, is there a plan, I guess? No, no, there's never a plan. I think the only planned sequel I ever had was I knew when I wrote A Dirty Job that I was going to write You Suck. And those are not sequels to one another, but they take place in the same neighborhood um, contemporaneously in San Francisco. And so I have a scene in those two books, which I also wrote um, consecutively, uh, that it's the same scene from a different point of view from different characters. And if you hadn't read one of the books, it wouldn't make any difference at all. You'd never know. Um, but it's, you know, and, and so those, that's the only time there was a plan. Um, I didn't plan to do a sequel to blood sucking fiends. I left it open for one, but I didn't plan to, I didn't plan to do a sequel to a dirty job. And that one was actually not that easy to do a sequel to, because the main character was, uh, 12 inches tall with a 10 inch long and he was in the body of a giant, a, a tiny stuffed alligator who wears a wizard outfit. And I was like, okay, that's going to be weird to bring that back. Um, uh, so, so no, there's no plan. And and the specific question is there's going to, is there going to be a sequel to, to lamb is I, I just don't think so. I just don't think it could do anything, but um, engender the, the reaction is like, well, you know, it was good, but it wasn't as good as lamb. 
because <laughs> because I've already experienced that. No matter what I write, people will read it mm. and they go, you know, I loved this book. Not as much as I liked Lamb, but I loved this book, and I'm okay with that. It's fine. Whatever. You know, I couldn't quit. I still had a mortgage. I couldn't quit after Lamb. Um, but, uh, you know, so I don't see a, a sequel to that. Also, I don't want to try and change the religion for a third of the world, which I'd have to if I had a sequel to Lamb. Um, and that's kind of a big rock to lift. But, uh, you know, some of them, I, I, I think when I wrote Pocket in, in King Lear, I knew I had the— Shakespearean canon that I could pop him into all these other plays. And, and I think that there was an idea that I might bring that character back. Um, and even now that I've written him into three, I don't want to write him for a while, but I might, you know, in the future. And, and that's how I feel about a lot of them is I'll do them by request. And in, in the past I would do, um, you, people now call them shared world books, but it would just be simply, I would be on deadline and I would, either be out of money or out of time. So I didn't have time to do research. So I would set a book in the same town that I'd set a previous book, or I'd set it in the same neighborhood as I'd set a previous book. And, and sort of to the delight of my readers and to the dismay of Hollywood, I would have characters wander in and out of other books, which, you know, readers love. It's like, Oh, an Easter egg. I know that character from this other book. Um, and I liked that Stephen King would do that. I was like, that's so cool. Um, but, Hollywood hates it because they're like, no, we own that character and you can never use it anywhere, anywhere at all, even if he just shows up in the street corner in another book. Well, it didn't occur to me. And I think I was about maybe 10 years into my career before I went, oh, this is a problem. Further than that, maybe. Um, and because uh, Disney bought my first book, Practical Demon Keeping, before it was ever a book as a movie. And they haven't made it, but they're very, very uh, rigid about property rights. And, you know, I think the contract says forever in the universe, <laughs> in any form, current or yet to be invented. I mean, it is – they literally have if, – if we discover a planet where they're developing a movie of practical demon keeping, Disney will sue them. Um, and so other – other companies that want to buy books that characters have walked through in that book, they get really sketchy, um, really sketch. In fact, little inside baseball, uh, the stupidest angel was supposed to be the walking dead. AMC came to my agent and they said, we want to be the next HBO. And at that point they hadn't, I don't think they had done Madman yet. And they said, we want to be the next HBO. We want to do these big series that are, um, you know, sweeping and we want to do, and we want the stupidest angel to do it. And then they, st they found out that there were characters from the Disney owned in, in the stupidest angel and they'd, Oh my God, have to rename them and stuff. And they freaked out. <laughs> they freaked out and they went, Nope, we're not going to do it. And then, you know, it turns out that they went and did a different zombie series that, you know, has had a, some success. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's – and I, ha I had another go with AMC in the, the last year. It's kind of like, come on, you guys, just don't come to me anymore. You know this is what's going to happen. But um, so it, it's – the sequel thing is it's not something I plan and I'm not in a position where I feel like I'm out of ideas. So I need to return to it. Usually if I return to um, a theme, it's because I like writing the character or because people have asked for it. Um and it's just something that I that I want to do. Um, I mean, honestly, after I used up my stuff for no, my material for noir, I probably didn't have to write this Midsummer Night's Dream based book. But I really I do like writing Pocket. Uh, so this is uh, because of because the conversation is happening in the time that it is. We've we've been talking to we've talked to several other authors in the last month or so, and um, I just want to see how. Uh, how it is for releasing a book during a pandemic where you can't go anywhere and, and kind of promoting virtually. Um, like it seems like people are finding ways to get through it, but how, how do you feel about it? Cause I've seen you in so many Q and A's, um, you know, talking and stuff. So it seems like that's kind of your, um, like it's something you're I'm, very comfortable with. So <laughs> how's it going? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it, I, but I don't know how it is. I don't know how it's doing as far as numbers go. I mean, it's it's immeasurably easier than flying all over the country and doing <laughs> a different city every day. But but I, you know, I don't. I like book tour. I like meeting my my readers. I've done. I've only done two virtual signings, and one we did the signing line, 
which would it basically gave me like a minute and a half on screen with each person that that bought a book. And if that had been in the numbers that happen when I actually do an event, I would be completely exhausted, you know, because it was it was yeah. uh, it was more intimate and that was great and I liked it, but it would have taken hours. I think I I think I talked to forty people and it took an hour. Well, I mean, there are some cities I go to where there's you know might be four five hundred people, you know. And I, I like meeting everybody, but I, I don't know how that – it kind of got out of hand. And it was it was fun, but I, at the end of it, I was like, wow, I'm not in shape for this. Um, so that's good. And then I did another one night before last, and, it, and we didn't do a signing line. I signed a bunch of book plates and I even and personalized them, but I did it sort of from a list. And then I just did you know 20 minutes of talking and like 40 minutes of Q&A. And it was good. It, I, it's, the process of it isn't bad. I, I just don't know how effective it is. I mean, your whole, the whole reason you're doing it is to promote the book. And I know it sounds very yeah. mercenary and you're never supposed to talk about that, but that's what you're trying to do. That's why that, you know, the biggest events I have, I do in the first week that the book's out because you want to make a place on the list and, and stuff like that. It's very strategic and businessy and doesn't sound artistic at all. But, but the reason I like to do it is because I like meeting, um, my readers. And, and at this point, meeting any other human being seems like a good idea because, <laughs> you know, I'm locked in the house with my wife and we're just like, when am I going to murder him? Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's, it's weird. I, it's, it's all weird. It's weird. Um, I'm not getting any work done on the book that I, I should be working on. And you would think, well, this is perfect. I think as a writer, I could tell you, I was like the, they talk about sending you to jail and it's like, and then they're going to put you in solitary confinement. And I'm like, I would get so much done. Um, but it turns out, <laughs> no, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, you're going to be locked into your house and you can't go anywhere. And it's like, well, I should at least finish a book during this time. Nope. I haven't done shit. Um, and it, it's, it's, dismay it's dismaying to me but the other authors that i'm in contact with are having the same experience i think it, you know you're supposed to be okay and and you're not uh, creatively um and the promoting a book everybody's learning there's no standard wisdom i mean it's it's one of those times where you know if you have an idea and you can make it happen you can try it and and that's what everybody's sort of doing and obviously you know with all the late night hosts doing their shows by zoom and so, or some facsimile thereof. Um, and in fact, news shows all being done and business shows all being done from people's homes. Um, you know, you just adapt to that and people I think have become accustomed to it. I, I it would be more interesting to me to hear what readers think about it. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe, maybe you guys can solicit comments after your podcast comes out is to find out what do they think of these these virtual events as opposed to a, a real one. I, I, I have a, as you said, I, I have a certain comfort with just going off the cuff and just talking to a group of people. Um, some authors prefer to read. I don't read. I'm awful at it. Um, so I, I would be interested to see uh, how other people react to it as as readers and as, as fans and stuff rather than, you know, authors who, you know, we're all completely chagrined when we have to do anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> I said I said that to to a friend of mine in a Q&A one time there was like four of us on a panel and and I said well the reason authors always talk about book tour when they get together is cuz they don't do anything else you know and um <laughs> And they know because they're authors that it's not interesting to talk about sitting in a room by yourself and clacking away on a keyboard. And my friend Catherine Ryan Hyde, who who wrote Pay It Forward, she said, I do stuff. What are you talking about? I do stuff. She was really <laughs> offended. It's like, sorry, Catherine. Um, and and to her to her, in her defense, she does do stuff. Um but I don't. So anyway, ask another question. Yes. So I know that we're um, only a few days away from the release of Shakespeare for Squirrels, but you made some statements and I got out a calculator and I did some math and it sounds like you might have a couple books left on your current contract. Right. That being said, do you are you able to tell us what readers can expect to see next? Yeah, I'm going to write a second. I guess it's second in the series, but it's not going to be dependent on that, much like this one, um, I want to write the characters from noir again, which is 1947 San Francisco. 
um, a bunch of guys, a bunch of street smart guys, um, not necessarily criminals, but they all talk like they are. Um, and they're, and all I can tell you is it'll have the same sort of cultural, uh, what's the word? It's, I don't want to use the word interface again, clash between the different cultures that are happening in the city at that time and weird shit will happen. Um, and I hope it will be funny, but, um, it, and it'll be probably a murder mystery of some sort, less a mystery and more sort of a murder adventure. But uh, that's what I'm going to do next. And then I, I have another book that I probably shouldn't talk about because I'm not sure I'm going to do it. But it's it's sort of along the lines of a big sweeping historical like Sacre Bleu um, set about the same period, but um, in Vienna and Prague rather than in Paris, because I will then have to go hang out in Vienna and Prague to do my <laughs> research. So. <laughs> So it's a tough job. Um, I've always liked the the bits of because you mentioned um, going places for research. Like, like I remember back, oh, I think it was Sacre Blue when you were um, posting a lot on social media about your experiences of doing research. So that's kind of that's that's a fun thing to see from an author to kind of get a peek behind the curtain of how mm-hmm. the research process is going. So I like that. It's uh well, it's fun to do, and because I write comedy, I don't think people understand it. But you know, because I had a, I did an interview with with um, the book reviewer from the Washington Post today, and he said, "Why don't people write funny novels?" And I think, <laughs> and my answer was, "Because it's hard," and <laughs> and that sounds really self serving, but it's not. I I really think that's why people don't write. I mean, if you could write a funny book, why would you not write a funny book? But what I don't think people understand is that, you know, because they go, why do you do this research? You're just writing these funny books. That's how I write funny books, because <laughs> my comedy is reactive. And so when I'll go and see places and I'm seeing them with fresh eyes, you know, my sort of default setting is to come back with something funny or just something funny will occur to me and I'll write that down, you know. So so the the research that you would think is going to find out what stuff looks like, which is certainly true, or, or how people behave in a certain situation, which is certainly true. Um, but it's also in what's funny and what what hits me in a way that I think is uh, is funny. And I'll give you an example of that. I I wasn't even going to go when I was writing the Lamb, which is set in first century um, Israel. I was like, I don't need to go there. All the people that I'm going to be writing about have been dead for 2,000 years. There's nothing to observe. And my wife goes, no, you need to go. You always get something when you when you do go on these trips. You need to go to Israel. And I'm like, okay, I'll go to Israel. And then she took off to Hawaii with a girlfriend. So I'm like, all right, what was that about? But anyway, um, I was in uh, what used to be Judea um, near the Dead Sea, and which is very appropriately named, and and also in Judea is Jericho. But everything in the Dead Sea, I've been to all the American deserts, and there's stuff in the American deserts. So there's saguaro cactuses and Joshua trees, and there's all kinds of life there. In the Dead Sea area of Judea, there is nothing. It is just like another, like the surface of the moon. And... Um, and there's a scene in one of the Gospels, I forget which one now, where Jesus heals two blind guys in Jericho, which is in this area. And so in the book, in Lamb, I had him, and he heals these two blind guys, and he makes them see again, and, and they're like, and he's sort of like, ta-da, and they're like, uh, <laughs> and, and he goes, what, 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 you can see, and they go, yeah, I just really thought there would be more color, Um what is that? And he goes, well, that's brown. And he goes, well, what's that color over there? And he goes, that would also be brown. Um, and so, and I would have never had that <laughs> bit, which I think is hilarious. Um, if I hadn't gone to this place and seen what was there and realized, oh my God, there's just not a living thing anywhere in this whole uh, landscape. And there's not anything that isn't sort of a khaki color in this whole landscape. So, and that, you know, I obviously pertains much more to much more, uh, uh, interesting places like Paris and London and, and medieval fortresses and some of the other places that have gone for books. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it comes through, but it, but it, it actually, in having done it for years, I, I realize it, it really informs the books a lot and it helps give a, a sort of a, another layer to them that wouldn't be there if I didn't do it. And it's a luxury mm-hmm. I have. I, I think some authors don't have the luxury of being able to do that, um, but, mm-hmm. but I do. 
I'm glad you told that story. Um, some time ago, I was listening to a podcast that it wasn't Adam Sandler that was on the podcast, but it was someone that knew him. And he had told a story about the movie Fifty First Dates, mm-hmm. which was um, set somewhere ambiguous, right? And Adam Sandler told him, like, hey, you know, it'd be really cool. What if we set this in Hawaii? And he kind of gave some reasons. And they said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. So they kind of rewrote it and set it in Hawaii. And it turns out that Adam Sandler had decided before that movie he wanted to go to Hawaii. And that for his subsequent few movies, that's what he did is he would they'd pitch him a movie and he'd go, oh, that sounds great. But what if we set it in this locale so he could right. vacation? For... So I'm glad you told that story because that's what I thought, too. I was like, all right, yeah, you're going to, you know, wherever, Vienna. Um, like, that's that's cool. You don't need to go to Vienna for that. So I'm, I'm glad that you clarified that a little bit because now I think whenever I hear someone is doing something for research <laughs> that it becomes that that opposite thing. Like I'm going to set a book there. So I have an excuse to go there and hang out for a week or two. I read, I read an article years ago in Esquire. I mean, I think I was still a kid and it was talking about the, the title of the article was writing for deductions. And somebody had gone through, I want to say it was like a, a Sydney Sheldon book and all these different restaurants that he eats at. And, and there's another <laughs> suspense writer, a contemporary suspense writer who does this too. And it's like, this dude is, is, having this thousand dollar meal and he can take it up his taxes because it's in the book. And um I I can admit somewhat to have done that, but not for tax reasons. I I can one of the things that you that you realize early on when you're writing novels is that you could spend your entire life in a room by yourself. And if you're ever going to have experiences in your life, you know, and you're going to be a novelist, you're going to have to go look at stuff. You're going to have to go do stuff that pertains to the book. So yeah, there's been, my book fluke was, I had lunch with a friend who had been to uh, an island uh, in, I want to say it's the Tongan archipelago, but it was, uh, it was an island called Rarutu or the Scooby Island as I call it. Cause it's Rarutu um, <laughs> where you can swim with humpback whales, which you can't do in American waters. It's against the law. And he had been in the water with singing whales. And I was like, I want to do that. And he goes, well, I know a whale scientist. Here's his address. And anyway, by by a, a whole lot of uh, sort of letters and sending books and begging and so forth, I ended up getting on a research permit for a, a whale research uh, uh, firm, I guess. Not really a firm, but a group um, in Hawaii. And I got to do all this stuff and hang out with these scientists. And it was a, a great experience it was an awesome experience. So it was really a book that started out with, I want to get in the water with humpback whales. How do I do that? <laughs> you know, if you've got, if you've got a, you know, like four books, you can send them off to a scientist and go, Hey, I've got these four books, you know, which I think is how many I had six, maybe at that time. And it's like, can I come and talk to you about whales? And they're like, sure, come on over. You seem legit. Um, so there is, you know, and I, I'm not so sure that Sacre Bleu wasn't about being able to live in Paris for a couple of months, but it was, uh, it was more than that. It was too. It was. I mean, that was a great, great time in my life. Um, was living in Paris for two and a half months, mm-hmm. but it was also. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to write the book without having done it. And I think the book is. You know, I'm pretty proud of how it came out. So, but I, yeah. Some, sometimes you got to do that. I there's. I watched a movie the other night. It was like, okay, the only reason that they did this is they wanted everybody in the cast. They went, we're going to go to this site. And then I watched another one that was that was set in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I was like, there's no way that anybody went, yeah, we want to go to Dhaka, Bangladesh, because the movie the movie convinced me there is no way I ever need to go to Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to dish Dhaka, Bangladesh, all you Dhakans. Um, We're big there. Oh, lots, are you? lots of download numbers now. Probably <laughs> not. I don't know. But probably I'm going to assume probably not. Um, yes. And, and on the, the Paris note, um, I am heartbroken. So 10 days from now, I was supposed to go to Paris for a week and that trip was canceled. Um, apparently, there's something going on where travel is difficult. Right. And so oh, I'm sorry. Have you been before? <laughs> uh, yes, been, have, twice. Oh, yes, OK, yes, cool. Twice. So but they, I've been. So here's the problem. When you plan really well, you book a trip like 10 months in the future. So then it's on your mind, right? Not right. I'm going to go back to Paris someday, but like I have a date and that date is May 15th. And then obviously that. Oh, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's thank you. I appreciate it. You mentioned um, having a couple of virtual signings. Is there any like events that you want to plug? 
Well, you know, if anybody wants to know what I'm up to, you can just check me out on Twitter. I'm um, at the author guy. Don't forget the author guy. And uh, all the events will be listed there where my books are available or listed there. You can find me at chrismore.com and I'm the author guy or Christopher Moore on Facebook. But Twitter's the main place that I'm active because everybody was you know, so freaked out on Facebook that you, you <laughs> might hurt somebody's feelings all the time that I kind of quit <laughs> doing much there. So um, anyway, I'm not in the secret. Uh, I'm, I'm not hard to find, I guess. <laughs> well, Chris, uh, thanks so much for taking a good chunk of time out to talk to us uh, about Shakespeare for Squirrels. Um, we've been in like the nine years that we've been doing this podcast. We've known that one day we were going to talk to you. Like it was just one of the, like, we, we eventually we're going to get there. So uh, this, is a, this is a very nice moment for us. And, and thanks for doing it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad I could do it. Let's do it again. I'll try and think of new stuff to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> give me a year or so and let's do it again. <laughs> Excellent. Well, just as I expected, what a terrific interview. That was that was really awesome. That's honestly like, so we've, we've interviewed a ton of people and one of the beauty, so we, we always prepare questions, but the questions don't dictate where the conversation goes. And the more off script or off off plan we go, usually the better the conversation gets. And so, like, of all the things that we, you know, expected to hear from him, like the <laughs> the shenanigans that go on in publishing wasn't something that I was, you know, ready for. So that was an excellent part of the conversation. I mean, the whole thing was great, but, like, these yeah. little things popped up that I didn't even think, oh, we'll be hearing him tell stories of the ups and downs of, of the publishing industry. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, very very cool publishing is one of those weird things it's like when you were a kid and you thought all the adults had their shit together like as a reader <laughs> like you assume that the, the 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 big publishing houses right like they all have their shit together and it's great to hear somebody kind of uh you know watch them peel back the curtain a little bit so you can see that their boneheads just like the rest of us are now the thing that surprised me and maybe it shouldn't have i don't know was that i feel like i fanboyed a little more than you did, or maybe a lot more, but I definitely fanboyed more than you did. <laughs> this is, this is what happens. So we go into some of these and, and, and I, you know, I hate to admit this publicly. Right. But like I, sometimes I get nervous beforehand. And again, it's because I've spent hours and hours with, with, with somebody's work and I've been a fan for years and years and I'm always nervous right up until the point where we like legit get started. So I'm nervous and, and, and like getting that awkward, like greeting over and, and doing that. But the second we get into it, like I have I have a good way of going into, I think, uh, a mode that makes me maybe seem a little more relaxed than, than I am. Mm -hmm. and, and I just I think that sometimes you have the opposite, like you were totally cool beforehand. But I feel like some in some, some places in there, maybe it was getting to you. Well, yeah, I think it. Yeah, there's um, I don't have much of a soul. And so, like, it's like a caged animal. And, like, when it has the opportunity to come out, like, if there's something that I'm, like, genuinely excited about, I think it, like, you know, like, it freaks out when it gets out of the cage. So that's yep. that's how I would explain it. Either way, wonderful, terrific interview. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll do this again in a year or so when he has another book coming up. Yeah. So we're at a point where this whole year building up to now has been very structured and planned out. We've reviewed 13 uh, books. Uh, we've, I don't know, how many authors? Is this the sixth one, the seventh one, something like that that we've talked to? I think so. Um, and there's there's a little gap coming up where we're not sure exactly what's going on, partially because um, Livius's travel plans got um, decimated along with his heart. Um, yep, dashed upon the rocks. So we know we're going to be doing a booked live where we're going to do a live stream and then make it an episode. But um, we're not really sure exactly what's happening uh, after that. So the next book you're going to get is going to be a couple weeks from now. Mm -hmm. I think we're pretty sure what that's going to be. I'm 99% sure because now I have it in my mind. But we'll keep you guys in suspense. All I can say is uh, I think that that one, if it goes down the way I think, will be a very fun review for a lot of our longtime listeners. If you've heeded our, uh, our recommendations over the years, then you'll be able to follow along. We'll call it a throwback. So a throwback episode coming at you soon. Yeah. Pretty, pretty interesting stuff coming up. And then June and July, um, end of June and all of July are just completely packed. So, um, we get a little bit of a break, a little breathing room. Livius is uh, looking forward to 
taking mm-hmm. a little bit of us like slowing the pace down a little bit but then we'll get right back to like this summer is just packed with uh, a lot of great content as well so um uh, that's looking forward a little bit but i think uh, we're ready to wrap this one up yep again big thanks to christopher moore for joining us tonight big thanks to you guys for listening until next time i'm olivia snedden and i'm rob olson go get that damn shakespeare for squirrels and keep reading <laughs> <laughs>